All right. A very warm welcome and good morning, all of you. Uh, my name is Anmol Krishan Sadeva, and the topic for today is understanding and implementing recurrent neural networks. So before starting, let's first see an example. Uh, if we are reading a book and it has, say, five chapters, we are on chapter one, we have read that, we are going to chapter two, we are starting reading it, but suddenly uh, we forgot everything that was there in chapter one. So how will we be able to understand chapter two? It means short-term memory plays a very crucial role. On that motion, uh, I would like to start with the recurrent neural networks. So uh, Martin has already introduced me. I'll be skipping this. Uh, prerequisites are you should be aware of Python language. Uh, you should have a decent knowledge of artificial neural networks and elementary linear algebra. So recurrent neural networks can be thought of as the neural networks which persist information, and we can think it of as sequential processes uh, basically uh, influencing decisions. So uh, in contrast to the traditional neural networks which don't persist information, recurrent neural networks are having this advantage over those. So we can think uh, recurrent neural networks as the networks having loops to themselves. I'll be explaining the architecture now. And uh, these are one of the most complex supervised deep learning algorithms we have today. So consider uh, a normal neural network, and it has many layers. Uh, X0, X1, X2 is basically the input that we are providing to the layer. A uh, uh, is a hidden layer. So the input from X0 goes to A, and the input gets transferred from one hidden layer to another hidden layer. Simultaneously, it gets transferred from the other hidden layer to the next hidden layer. And we can think it of uh, squashing this thing that you see on your right-hand side into the thing that is known as the vanilla RNN. That means it is having loop to itself. Uh, RNNs can be uh, of uh, many architectures. Uh, the first one is one-to-many architecture, in which you provide one input and you can get many outputs. So. Uh, you can think of, say, uh, you provide with an image, and it provides with certain caption. So an image is mapped into caption of, say, five or six words. So it is one image getting mapped into five or six words. That is one-to-many transformation of RNN. Likewise, we have many-to-one. So many-to-one can be thought of as, say, we are having video frames, and uh, uh, we are generating text out of the video, so it can be mapped to many to many or many to one. So we can get from a video a, a sentence. And we, uh, similarly, we can have many to many transformation also. So recurrent neural networks have the following applications. That is image captioning, subtitle generation, uh, time series classification, language modeling, natural language processing. Even chatbot development is also based on RNNs nowadays. So uh, there is a major problem in the vanilla RNN. That is, if the RNN is having so many layers, uh, so adjusting the weights at each hidden layer is a problem. That means once uh, the information from X0 is transferred to A, it is multiplied by some weight matrix, then transferred to the next layer, then transferred to next, then transferred to next. And simultaneously, the output gets generated on the top. Now we have something called as loss function. That is the difference between the actual output and the predicted output. So if the loss functions for, say, ht plus 1 uh, generates some uh, error, so there's some like error of, say, 0.15%, and it's need to be backpropagated throughout the network. And backpropagating through a network that is so large is difficult because uh, each time you can think of, say, W is getting multiplied at each layer, and multiplying W, that is between 0 and 1, multiplying anything by 0 and 1, uh, between 0 and 1, say 0 0.2, if we multiply something by 0 0.2 multiple times, then it will be uh, tending to very small value. So it will be like the gradient will be propagating through the uh, whole chain, but it will be taking much time to train. So it is not feasible solution. So vanilla RNN uh, suffers from the vanishing gradient problem. Likewise, we have the 
exploding gradient problem. So exploding gradient problem is when the value of W is greater than one. So if you multiply simultaneously uh, a number more, uh, by uh, say a factor of more than one, then it will tend to uh, always go and multiply to many huge values. Now, uh, the vanishing gradient problem can be thought of as W is less than one, and exploding gradient can be thought of as W is greater than one. To solve these vanishing gradient problem and the exploding gradient problems, we use uh, certain techniques. So for exploding gradient uh, problem, we have truncated back propagation. So in truncated back propagation, we divide the whole set into certain batches. And in those certain batches, we just backpropagate within those certain batches sequentially. In system of rewards and penalties, it is like reinforcement learning. So we provide rewards for, say, if, if the backpropagation is doing well, else we provide penalties. And we have gradient clipping. If, if the gradient goes beyond some range, then we just clip that gradient and the, uh, we don't propagate it through the network. For managing gradient problem, we have smart weight initialization that is like a guesswork. Then we have eco-state networks and we have LSTM. So I'll be talking today of LSTM that is long short term memory. And it is uh, one of the most uh, used variants of RNN. So LSTM is one of the most used variant of RNN. And uh, the approach for LSTM is making the weight W equal to one. So you can think of you are not having W less than one, you are not having W greater than one, so what else we can do? We can just make W equal to one. Now, uh, coming to the architecture of the LSTM, C is the new introduction in here. HT is uh, the state of uh, the current input, the hidden layer, and CT can be thought of as a cell state. So in here, if we provide the input XT and the hidden layer, and we uh, transfer this thing to four states, F, I, G, O. F is the, you can say, the final gate of forget gate. I is the input gate. G is another gate. There's no name for it. And O is the output gate. We take, we uh, apply the uh, function like the element-wise multiplication and the addition uh, using this formula. So CT is basically F times, that is forget gate times the CT minus one, that is the previous state, uh, the, the previous state of the cell that was there. So it is basically uh, forgetting some part of the memory. So it is like uh, you, you were reading something and uh, you actually forgot some part of it, but you retained certain part of it. So this is actually forgetting major part of it and retaining some part of it. And that some part is used for training the rest of the network. And this is actually uh, 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 applied through the 10H function and the output uh, gate is multiplied and we get the output of the hidden layer. So uh, comparing the RNN and the LSTM, uh, it is, uh, we can say the LSTM has a sophisticated architecture in terms that it has a cell state and using this cell state it is like a super highway through which W is not getting changed. So, so we are actually uh, changing the element-wise uh, fraction that is F, and we are not changing the weight matrix. So multiplying anything by element or scalar multiplication is much simpler than the matrix multiplication, which is involved in the weight matrix multiplication that is used in the vanilla RNN. So that is why the vanishing gradient problem goes off in LSTM. Now uh, we can start building the LSTM and the code uh, I'll be providing uh, for that. Uh, so you can just uh, join in this. You can just uh, implement this uh, as, it, as it is now. I'll be sh just shifting to the implementation thing. So the major tasks of implementing the RNN involves the data pre-processing. Data pre-processing, then building the recurrent neural model and making making the predictions and visualizations. So before implementing, 
uh, we need certain libraries, that is Keras library, then we use uh, scikit-learn, we use TensorFlow, and uh, yeah. So first task is data preprocessing. So we import the NumPy uh, library, we import the Matplot library, we import the Pandas library. The NumPy library is for visualizing the results. Uh, uh, is for array uh, uh, manipulation, matplot is for visualizing the results, and pandas is for managing the data sets. Because uh, the Keras library, yeah, uh, zoom, okay. Can you see now? Okay. So uh, since the Keras library doesn't support the data frames of pandas, we need to use the NumPy arrays for Keras library. Now, uh, before starting, uh, let me introduce you to the problem. Uh, so today we'll be predicting the stock price for the Google uh, for first month of 2017. So these are the records that you can see. These, these are the records that you can see. So these are 20 records, that is, uh, each month has 20 financial days, and that means weekdays. So this is the record that we have to predict on, and the training data set is this. So we'll be predicting the open stock prices of Google for first month of 2017, and we'll be training on the year 2012 to 2016, so five years of data. Now, actually, the prediction should look like this. So if I take these two columns and just insert the plot for it. So the result that we should uh, predict should be like this. So uh, today our task is to mimic this behavior of the stock price in January 2017. Now let's get started. So the training data set uh, is, I, I'm calling it Google stock price train.csv. I'm importing it as a data set, uh, the pandas data frame. So I'm using pd.read csv. Then uh, since this uh, data frame uh, uh, contains many columns, but we only require the open stock prices. The open stock prices, that is column one. So I use the iLock function for selecting, for the first parameter in iLock is the colon. That means it will be selecting all the rows. And the column, uh, the second parameter is the column parameter, that is one to two. So one uh, points to the open and two basically points to the next column, but since the second uh, value is omitted, so it is just considering the first column that is the open column. And dot values is for converting it to the NumPy arrays. So we are just converting the dat uh, pandas data frame to the NumPy array. Now we need to scale this uh, data, and we will be using the scikit-learn preprocessing uh, library. And from that, we'll be using the minmax scalar class. So SC is the object of minmax scalar class. And the feature range parameter here tells that you need to uh, convert uh, the values of the column uh, between the range 0 to 1. So everything will be scaled between 0 to 1. And after that, we just fit and transform. So fit and transform means Fitting uh, basically means normalizing the data. So it actually takes the minimum value from that column and the maximum value from that column, and it uh, puts it, the transform puts it into the normalization function. The normalization function uh, can be the standardized function or the normal normalization function. So in standardized function, we take the mean uh, value and we subtract it from uh, the actual value, and then we divide at my mean value, but in normalization uh, function, we take the min value, we subtract it from the main value, and we divide it by the difference between the max value and the min value. 
So uh, it is a basic normalization thing that we are doing. So fit and transform does this thing. After that, we need to create the training uh, data, uh, the training list, and the uh, predicted ground truth list. So X train is a list, an empty list, and Y train is an empty list. That is uh, for the training, uh, you can say set, and the ground truth set. So uh, we have uh, one, two, five, eight records uh, here in the, predict, uh, in the stock prediction data. So we have one to five eight records. These are one to five eight records. And uh, we are taking the time step as 60. So what is time step? Basically, time step is a very important concept here in the recurrent neural networks. It is basically how many observations you will be taking into consideration for training the next value. Or you can say, if you are focusing on uh, just uh, predicting the ith value, then what set of values you will be taking into consideration before that ith value. So it is basically, I'm starting from the 60th record. It means it will be taking the data of three months, training on that, and predicting the 61st value. So it is just uh, an assumption you can take 20 days, 18 days, any anything, but it is like, uh, during my uh, testing, I took 60 and it, it produced great results, so I'm using 60 as the time step value. And 1258 is the uh, number of records. So I append to the empty list the training scaled uh, values from the i minus 60th value to the current value. So that is basically appending, it is making an array in which one record contains 60 previous values from the current value. So it is like a six, uh, you can say n cross 60 uh, matrix that is getting created. Now the Y train is basically the ground truth and the ground truth will be just having the current value. So it is from I to I plus one and zero is basically the column. That is the first column because we have already cleaned our data and we are just having one column for open stock prices. So zero points to that thing. Now X train comma Y train equals NP dot array. So it is converting to NumPy array. So we are generating X train NumPy array and Y train NumPy array. Then we need to reshape the X train array. So reshaping means that uh, to work seamlessly with the you can say uh, NumPy arrays uh, and the RN and stuff, we need to add an extra dimension to the, uh, this existing NumPy array. So basically, this is, uh, this basically x train dot shape is the number of rows, x train dot shape one is number of columns, and one is basically the indicator uh, uh, column, that is the open stock column. So we are just reshaping to build it a 3D array from a 2D array. Now the first step of data pre-processing has been done and we are on to the next step of building the RNN. Does anyone have any doubt uh, in this? Yeah. Yeah, so basically we need to train the data. Uh, we, we need to say, we are not having, we are having values say 700, 800, 1000, two, uh, say 20, 22, five in the stock prices. And uh, it is not ideal, it will take a lot of time and it will not generate good results if the data is not scaled between some values, say zero or one. So I have provided range zero to one to make it uh, more cleaner. So it will be approximated to the nearest value. So it is just, cleaning the data and smoothening the data. So scaling has that uh, use. Yeah. The uh, X train for the amount of uh, you chose 60 because yeah. you can see uh, the results was okay. Yeah. You can't see the results. Yeah. You don't know the results. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you choose a, a better Right. Number? So basically, uh, the question that you are asking is a very good question, and we use something called grid search for this. Uh, that is basically a part of hyperparameter tuning. 
So uh, these are basically pointing towards the hyperparameter stuff. So 60 is like a hyperparameter only, which is making or which is amending how the predictions are being made. So uh, what we can do is, uh, uh, after this is done, like this is the first go for, for you, you all people, but I tried it with certain parameters. And in the hi uh, hyperparameter tuning, the grid search library provides you with, you can say, you can provide arrays of values. Say, I have something called, say, time step. So I provide time step equal to 30, 60, 300, suppose. And uh, I have another value, say, optimizer. And I, I take three optimizers, suppose, which are used for this type of regression. This is a regression problem because we are dealing with the continuous values. Uh, so we take, uh, say, RMS prop optimizer that I'll be telling you more about. And we take Adam optimizer and we say N Adam optimizer. So it will be doing a cross product. So it will be take this parameter 30 time step, cross it with the, the first uh, RMS prop and generate result. Then 30 Adam generate result, 30 N Adam generate result. Then it will be doing same thing with 60 RMS prop, 60 Adam, 60 N Adam. So it will be generating nine results. And from those nine results, you can uh, actually get the matrix formed, which will be showing which one is generating good accuracy and less loss. So, so uh, using that grid search thing, you can actually judge which hyperparameter to tune to what value. So that is part of grid search. Yeah, thanks. No, I have not because it is like uh, I, I don't have that much time for showing. Yeah. So now building the RNN stuff. So we are importing four uh, classes: uh, sequential, dense, LSTM, and dropout. Sequential class is for basically inputting the first uh, you can say set of inputs to the neural network. Dense class is uh, for the last layer of the neural network. That's the output layer. LSTM class is for uh, making the hidden layers of the neural network, and dropout is for something called as dropout regularization, which I'll be telling you more about further. So we are making a regressor. Since it's not a classification problem, it's, we are dealing with the continuous data set, so it's a regression problem. So we make an object of sequential class called regressor, and we add the first layer to it. So it's regressor.add. So regressor.add will add layers to the neural network. So first layer is the uh, LSTM layer, the hidden layer that we are adding. And units, equ uh, units equal to 50 means the number of neurons you can say that we are introducing to the network. So this layer will have 50 neurons. And uh, you can take it any value. So it was, again, the hyperparameter stuff. So I took 50. Then return sequence is equal to true means that the output of this layer will be getting forwarded to the next layer. And input shape equals x train dot shape one that points to the columns of the data set and one is for reshaping it to the third dimension. So we are just using the, the column and the third dimensional value for it. Uh, we don't need to use the uh, first uh, row dimension uh, value for it. So this will be adding the first layer and adding the first layer uh, may introduce overfitting, say. So to deal with the overfitting problem, that is to, say, avoid the noise that is being created by the overfitting stuff, we use the dropout regularization stuff. So dropout actually means dropping out certain number of neurons from the layer. So out of 50, I have chosen 0.2, that's 20% to be dropped out. So it means it will be just considering 40 neurons for the next layer, and out of those, 50 neurons, 10 neurons at random, or say 20% of those 50 neurons will be dropped out at random. So this actually avoids the overfitting problem. Yeah. Yeah, so basically it's a stacked LSTM, so I am using four hidden layers in this, and uh, for the four layers I am adding four dropouts. So uh, yeah. So you have more than one iteration, right? Mm hmm. And with each iteration, you drop 10 neurons. Yeah. But you replace, you replace them or you drop them mm -hmm. 
No, no. Uh, it's like uh, during the epochs. Epochs is basically how many time the data, the full data, will be propagated forward and backward to uh, lessen the loss, the loss generated by you can say the gradient. So it's actually uh, for the number of epochs, the dropout will be done at random. So dropping out means just not considering 20% of those neurons randomly in one epoch. And in the next epoch, it will again be choosing random 20% and then be not considering. So it's like a random stuff going on. I have chosen 100 epochs. So it's fully propagating the data forward and backward. And it training uh, is done 100 times on this data. So it's like for each epoch, it is generating some random value. Uh, some, it's choosing some random neuron, and it's dropping out 10 random neurons. So it actually avoids the overfitting problem in that way. Yeah. And then uh, similarly, uh, I'm adding uh, three more layers. So this is uh, regressor.addLSTM. Now uh, you have added the first layer initially. So uh, you don't need to provide the input shape because LSTM class already knows that what is the input. So from the second layer, you don't need to provide this para uh, parameter input shape. It will automatically take uh, from the previous thing. And uh, this is the second layer. Then this is the third layer and the fourth layer. In fourth layer, we don't actually need the output return sequence because uh, we need to pass it through the dense layer and not another LSTM layer. So we'll be omitting the return sequence equal to true parameter. We can state here return sequence equal to false, but the default value of return sequence is false. So we are not putting here the parameter. And dense is the final output layer. So basically it is the units equal to one means it will be having just one neuron. That's the resultant neuron. So dense uh, is actually corresponding to the result of the neural network. Now, uh, the building of RNN has been done, but the compilation phase is still left. Compilation actually means uh, compiling uh, with a certain a loss function and, the opt and choosing the right optimizer. So as I told you earlier, RMS prop and Adam are the two uh, optimizers that are used uh, with RNN. And Adam is the one that usually works apart from, uh, say, RNN also. It works with CNN also. So it is a much wider optimizer that you can use. And it gives good results. Again, a hyperparameter tuning thing. So I have chosen the optimizer as Adam. And since it is the regression stuff, so we will be using mean squared error loss function. Uh, if it would have been, uh, say, the classification stuff, then we would have used the cross entropy or binary cross entropy loss function. Then uh, we have compiled this, and then we are ready to fit it. So fitting the RNN uh, for the training set, so we pass the fit function x train, y train, epochs equal to 100, batch size is 32. So it will be taking batch of 32. It will be dividing the data set into 32, uh, say, element batches, and it will be working on those batches. It's again hyperparameter tuning stuff. So uh, what I mean by hyperparameter tuning is that tuning the parameters uh, of the classes in such a way uh, that it provides good result or good predictions. Now, uh, the task three is the prediction task. So we have done the RNN building stuff. We have done the data pre-processing stuff. Now is the task to predict the results. So actually, uh, the data set for predicting was separate than the data set for testing. So uh, we just uh, take the test data set and we merge that test data set with the actual prediction data set to make it a to say a total data data set which will contain every value mm -hmm. so here we are just converting the read csv uh, we are creating a data frame of the test data set and then we are again converting it to the numpy array as we did it with the price uh, the prediction price stuff then we concatenate the open uh, column of the prediction data set with the test column so it will be 1 2 5 8 plus 20 records, that's uh, one, two, seven, eight records in total. Because uh, during the time of testing, we need to have, uh, we need to consider the previous 60 records and 
for, for considering those previous 60 records, we should have a data set incomplete. So I'm just uh, using this complete data set, and axis zero is for vertical join. Input equals data set merged. Uh, so basically, it is taking, uh, it is creating another, you can say, uh, NumPy array, which is uh, based on the merged data set. And it will be taking the values, uh, 60 values from the current state. So counting from 1 to 5, record number 1 to 5, 8, it will be taking into account the previous 60 values to predict the results of the record 1 to 5, 8. Now we are reshaping it uh, again. And since we have already fitted the data uh, earlier, we'll just be transforming it. So we are just taking the input uh, NumPy array, and we are transforming the input NumPy array for making the predictions. And uh, we use another list called xTest. And we append to this list the values uh, from uh, the, the last 20 rows that we need to test. And then we form the NumPy array of this, and uh, we just shape it again, reshape it again. Now the prediction can be done using the predict function of the regressor class, uh, the, the, sequence, uh, uh, the class that we formed. So regressor.predict basically uh, makes prediction on the x test list that we just formed, uh, the NumPy array. And inverse transform is the function that is used to inverse the normalization stuff that we did. So now we are just uh, you can say we are inversing the scaling that we did. Uh, we, we, we made uh, the scaling from 0 to 1. We normalized the results from 0 to 1. We are just inversing the transform to actually convert them into the uh, real value. So it will be something like 0 point something is converted into 770. That is, say, a stock price for one record. And then we plot uh, these results. So. Uh, since the time is short, I have already uh, run this thing in Pacham. So it was, say, 100 epochs. And you can see that uh, I'll just uh, show you, say, you see that with increasing number of epochs, the loss function is decreasing. So the value of loss is decreasing. So the loss must have started with, say, some value 0.3 or something, 0 0.0034. And it's now, uh, at the end of 100 epochs, it's 0 0.001315. So you can see, as I'm going uh, up, the loss function is increasing. So the value of loss function is increasing. It means that the training has been done correctly, and we have achieved certain level of accuracy so that the loss function has minimized its value from, say, it's in 30s or 40s, say, 0 0.0030 to 0.13. And we can see that uh, the plot that we have. It's following the trend uh, of ups and downs of the market, but it's not actually predicting the correct values, though it is following the trend. That's like if the values is, uh, value of the stock price is going up, it is following that trend. So blue is the predicted one, and the red is the actual one. So uh, using these parameters, I was able to generate this result doing uh, hyperparameter tuning with grid search will uh, definitely improvise uh, these results, and uh, it will actually uh, match with some error uh, with the actual red line. So it is like just following the trend with the red thing. So we can see that it is actually following, following the trend. So we can see uh, on x-axis at uh, point 2.5, it is just going down. Uh, then it's following the upward trend, and then it's being stable at the end. So it was this prediction that, using these hyperparameters, I was able to make. Yeah. 
So the source code for this, uh, I'll be up, uh, updating my slides, uh, but it's on, uh, it's on GitHub. It's at this address. I'll be just up uploading my slides and it will get uploaded on the session page. And uh, after that, so these are my acknowledgments. Uh, Professor Martin Christian, then uh, uh, my supervisors, uh, Christopher Wola, uh, for creating good blogs. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, then you can ask, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Can you pass? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask how did you tune your architecture? Why four layers? Uh, okay, so uh, when we deal with RNNs, we cannot go beyond, say, we, we generally choose two, three, or four layers because it actually doesn't uh, make any sense going beyond four layers as the results are, uh, will not improve over choosing four layers. So for just showing the implementation stuff, I used four layers, and it was just making some good assumptions uh, when uh, compared with using three layers or two layers. But generally in RNNs, we just don't go beyond four layers. It, it can be the case that if we are using RNNs with some other neural network, say CNN for, say, image captioning task, then it will be another scenario. We'll be getting the results of the vector generated from the CNN, and we'll be transferring those CNN uh, results into the first hidden layer, that's the H0 thing. And uh, those results will be just making further, you can say, vectors forming vectors, which will then be propagated throughout the chain. So it will be having more impact on the RNN training, and in that case, we can just lower down from four layers to two layers, because it is already having lots of information from the CNN stuff. So it is basically based on that thing. So if we consider a basic example, uh, that's the perfect roommate example that is uh, very famous in the field of RNN. Uh, if you have a roommate who cooks food for you, and he cooks, say, apple pie, chicken, and uh, say anything, uh, X, Y, Z, anything. So on sunny day, uh, he cooks, say, apple pie. And uh, if it's another sunny day, then he just goes off uh, the duty and doesn't cook anything. If it's rainy day, he's at home and he cooks next dish. So he uh, cooks chicken for you. So it is like, the first input is weather, that's sunny or rainy. The second input is the dish that he made previously. So these input provided to a state will predict the next output. So it's like a vector product plus the addition of some of the other things that goes in complex neural networks. Uh, you can just make sense out of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be making it public, yeah. Okay, thank you very much again. Yeah. Thanks. No, uh, basically I applied the inverse transform function. So, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will be inside this range, but uh, the results will get inverted. So the current value, so it will be inverse transform function, so that will be adding something divided by something that is lesser. So it will be just exploding the value from 0, 1 to scale of say hundreds. The, yeah, 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 it's, it's, yeah, that is why the prediction is not uh, predicting the actual result. It is having some variation with the results. Because you are using some smoothened value and using that smoothened value you are going to predict uh, actual results. So uh, these will have variations between uh, them. Okay. Thanks.